Father, we thank you for a chance to come to John's Revelation. We thank you that this is the book where you promised a blessing for if we would read and adhere to the words. Please let us do that tonight. Would you walk among us? Would you highlight what we need to know? Because this is so deep and rich and good and you are faithful and I know you'll help us. Let us not take anything lightly, but be serious minded because your time to come back and get us is getting really, really close. Lord, we know that we long for you to come. We want you to appear, and we thank you for that. And tonight as we discuss that, would you just make that even more real to everyone that's hearing? In Jesus' name, amen. We are in the third section of Revelation. If you will remember, and I probably will review this every time, this is the only book in the Bible that outlines itself. In the very first chapter, it says... And these are Jesus' words he wants the Apostle John to, to write down because he's dictating to him. And he said, write down the things which have been, the things which are, and the things which shall be. And if they spoke Greek, which they did, Jesus spoke Greek, the language, the business language of the era of the first century was Greek. So the apostles, when they spoke to each other, spoke Greek. They would have said metatauta. The things after after what? After the churches. I'm I'm here to tell you tonight, and and I'm going to only espouse my view on this. You have a right to disagree with me. Please study. Don't believe one thing I say. But I'm a solid believer in the rapture. I believe in the pre-trib rapture. And I make no apologies for that. And everything I'm going to tell you is going to reinforce that view. If you have a different view, yay. I'm not interested in hearing it. Because I've spent a lot of time researching this, and I'm going to give you a hundred scriptures to back this up. Um, I know there are a lot of denominational churches today that don't talk about the rapture. They said it happened, it was a, a thought that came about in the 1800s. That's hogwash. Because the very first book of the Bible, Job, talks about rapture. So what I say is it's all through the Bible, and I'm going to take you through some of those passages. So I'm just going to say it right now. I'm a pre-trib rapture believer, and that's how I'm going to teach this, this book. So having said that, I'm going, to, I'm going to pick my first point right here. When in chapter 1, when Jesus gave the divine outline for this book, he said to John, and I'm going to repeat it, and then I'm going to prove how it already points to rapture. He said, write the things which you have seen. Well, what had he seen? He'd seen the glorified Jesus show up in his prison cave in Patmos. The only description we have of Jesus in the Bible is in Revelation 1 with the hair and the priestly garments and the bronze feet. This is the resurrected glorified Jesus. That's the first part of the outline. That ends in chapter 1. That's the only place we get that description of Jesus. That's the first part of the outline. Here's what I want you to pay attention to the second part of the outline. We just finished at seven weeks on seven churches. That's the part of the outline which is called the things which are. Why were they called that? Because in John's time, those were real churches that were in existence, which were in John's time. Yes, I know they have histor historical values, and we've talked all that. We've picked that apart for seven weeks. But I want to say this. The third part then says the things which are meta tauta. The things, he said, right, number three, he said, write the things which are after these. Well, what is it after? It's after the churches. What is after the churches? The rest of this book is about the tribulation. The churches are no more. Point one for a rapture. That outline tells you right then there's a rapture because the third part happens after the churches. Church is gone. You're going to find in chapter 4, we're going to see where the church is. When John gets called up by God, John, in your mind, should be this. He should be a New Testament saint, which he was. He was an apostle. He's still alive when he's writing the Revelation. 90-ish, maybe, 89, on Patmos. Jesus, his best friend, comes and dictates to him. He's still alive. Mm -hmm. And he is. And he may still be alive to this day. That's a whole other story. But he's still alive, so he's writing this down. And Jesus said, you're going to write after all the churches are gone. That's the second part of the outline. 
the things which are, he said, meditata after this, then write this. And what happens? We see the tribulation. I think my point one is churches are gone, tribulation starts. That almost hangs enough evidence right there for the rapture. But I'm going to continue on. If you want to know what I've labeled chapter four, I think it's the rapture chapter of the Bible. Because I think that starts after this. That starts the tribulation. You're going to see John then. Jesus is going to use him throughout as a picture of the New Testament church. And why would he use John as that picture? Because he is the New Testament church. He was one of the first believers in Jesus. He loved Jesus right off the bat when John, when John was called. He followed him immediately. He's going to, and all the other apostles are dead by this time. He's the only one left. So he is the classic example of the New Testament church. And Jesus is going to say, to John, come see, come see, come see, come see. And he's going to pick him up. And we've talked about this before. From now on, we're strapped down because this is going to be a roller coaster ride. John's going to get taken up into heaven, and what he sees, I can't even do it justice. So we're going to start this last part of the book of Revelation, the Metatalta, the things that happen after the church is gone. So what's that? That's what it means. Well, where did the church go then, begs the question. <laughs> they got raptured. And tonight we're going to spend a little bit of time on the Jewish wedding. We're going to spend a little bit of time on uh, understanding what this whole Jewishness of this book means. To understand Revelation, the 404 verses in Revelation have 800 Old Testament references. You're going to do a pretty good share of them tonight. I'm going to... I'm going to take you back into the Old Testament big time tonight. And you're going to get a really good look at John's bird's eye view. Because from this point on, John is taken out of the earth, above time and space. And ask me how God does that. And I will tell you, don't have a clue. But it's not new. There's at least seven different raptures in the Bible. And John is one of the raptures. John is actually, rapture, by the way, is a Greek word. That is harpazo, which means snatched away. He snatched away out of this earth to look. Is John raptured? Uh-huh, yeah. Was Enoch? Yes. And I'm going to name you several others that were. And it simply means snatched away. So when those doubting Thomases or whoever they are come at you and say, there's no rapture in the Bible, say, do you speak Greek? Because the word harpazo is in the Septuagint, which is the Bible that the New Testament Apostles were carrying around. It is in there. Yes. I just don't have to speak Greek. And we call it rapture, but harpazo is in there. So that's true. And I guess I beat that dead horse enough. But I want to tell you what we're doing tonight. We're going to spend a lot of time on the rapture tonight. You need to know what you know what you know. Because unless you can be an apologetic for that theory, <clears throat> you'll believe every whim of doctrine that, that blows your way. And there are lots of them, such as... Wow, the church is going to go through all the tribulation because who do you think you are to get to deserve being escaping that? And what I say to him, I'm no one, but I have Christ Jesus that covers me and he is everything. He already bought that, bought and paid for that price. And I'm not Jewish. The tribulation is to bring the Jews back to God. It's not to bring the church back to Christ. We're already his. Bought and paid for on a tree called Calvary and the blood that is shed. When God looks at me, he sees that. I'm his. There is no more reconciliation for me. I've already been paid for. There's no reason as a New Testament believer, born again, for God to thump you to death to bring you to him. You're already his. But the Jewish nation is still that stubborn, stiff, stiff necked people. They always have been. And they still haven't come to him. That country of Israel that sits in the Middle East right now is not there except in secularism. They're not there as coming back to God. They're in a secular position, and that's who they are. They have not come to Christ. Sure, I'm not talking individuals. There are Jews, of course, that have. I'm talking the nation as a whole is a, secular, is a secular country. They have not come back to God. That's what the tribulation is for. 
You want to know this too, and this is part of knowing that you know that you know. There are two different comings again by Jesus, or two. One is called the rapture, one is called the second coming, and we're going to pick those apart. They are entirely different appearances by the King of Kings. Let's go through some of that. I've got a pretty good outline for you. In the rapture, the believers are translated out. In the second coming, Jesus comes to earth. Nobody's, nobody's taken out. In the rapture, the saints go to heaven. In the second coming, the saints are on your white horses coming back to earth with the king. In the rapture, the earth is not judged. You're just snatched away. But boy, boy, oh boy, in the second coming, Jesus is coming to judge the whole earth. These are different instances. And, and I think this outline helps us. In the rapture, it could happen at any minute. It is imminent. There is nothing left but what it could happen any any time. Nothing left to do. But the second coming, there are a set of prerequisites that have not happened yet. One of which is huge. That Israel must beg for him to come back and rescue them. That's Hosea 5.15 if you don't know that. Of course that hasn't happened. That won't happen until they get to Petra. And the rapture, it says it's not in the Old Testament as such. I'm going to prove to you that there's about four or five really big hints. And the, in the second coming, it is all over the Old Testament. It talks about him coming again, coming again. Even David, King David talks about it. The rapture is for, is for believers only. We are the only ones going to be privy to that. I don't suspect the world will see it. Won't quite understand what happened. It, it's solely for us as believers. But when he comes back on that big white war horse in Revelation 19, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he's Lord. It's too late. They've taken the mark. But everyone will see him in the second coming. And the rapture. It, it happens before the day of wrath. You are snatched away. You are harpazoed out before the day. I just proved that in the outline. In the second coming, it comes at the end of the day of wrath. He finishes up the tribulation by his second coming when he comes to battle the whole earth. In the rapture, there is no references to Satan at all. You'll hear about the archangel, the um, voice, the trumpet, the shout of the archangel. I don't hear anything about the Satan there. But boy, in the second coming, Satan gets bound. He comes, Jesus comes to battle him and he binds him up. And you hear all that story. We'll, we will get to that at the end of Revelation. It's a really good part of the story. In the rapture, Christ comes for his own, the believers. But in the second coming, he comes with his own. We're with him. We've already been snatched up. We're on our horses. By the way, mine's name's Toby. Had a big old paint, 30-year-old paint, and he died in my pasture, and I was laying by him when he died, and I said, I'll see you again, because I believe God painted him white. So I, I, I know mine. You guys may know yours too. Um, uh, in, the, in the rapture, it's in the clouds, in the air, he never steps foot on earth. He snatches us up to the clouds in the air. But on the second coming, oh, does he step on earth. Oh, yes, does he come. He goes to Petra, and Isaiah sees him and says, Who is that coming with your robes all bloodied? And then he rescues him, and he steps on the Mount of Olives and splits it in two. Yes, he comes to earth, but not in the rapture. There are two different instances. In the rapture, Jesus comes to claim his bride. In the second coming, he comes back with his bride. You come with him in the second coming. You're his bride. In the rapture, only his own see him. In the second coming, every eye on earth will see him. These are distinctly different instances. The rapture causes the tribulation to begin. Second coming causes it to end. I made that little chart for you because people that will tell you, oh, I believe in the second coming, but I don't believe in the rapture. And then you start pulling up these, well, when is this then? This is not, when is, they get totally confused, but you will not be. You see the difference. From Revelation 4 to 19, 
we are going to see this whole section of God's judgment upon the earth. It is called the tribulation. Jesus specified the last three and a half years as the great tribulation. We specify the seven years as the tribulation. Now here's something really unique. Up to this point, we've had lots of titles for Christ. Lots of them. Every letter had three or four titles for him. Those were all Gentile titles. Those were things Gentiles would understand. From this point on, chapter 4 on, everything's going to be Jewish references. That's why you, we have to understand the Old Testament from now on. Because from chapter 4 on, every name of Christ, every reference is going to be Jewish. Because, and this is my point two of why we're raptured. This is point two. Because the church is not involved from chapter 4 to 19, we are in the heavenlies. This message 4 to 19 is for the Jews. And the language shifts. John shifts the language from chapter 4 to be very, very Jewish. We'll pick that out. I'll help you understand that. I think the subtleties of these things just prove our point about the rapture. I'm going to bring all this out to you. And like I said, you can argue with me if you want to. You're not going to change my mind. <laughs> I'm totally convinced that this is what happens. We do get raptured. The actual heart and nitty-gritty of the fighting of the tribulation, we're going to start in around Revelation 6. The 4 and 5 are going to be the throne room of God when John's taken up to see and he's seen everything. The real fighting and all the bowls and the judgments start Revelation 6, just so you kind of know what we're coming at. So we've, we've talked about the divine outline. I think that proved to you, proved to me, that the things which are have passed now. That's the churches. When the third section, meta tauta, the things after the churches. So we're into what we call the tribulation. If you want just a brief snapshot, Revelation 4.1, we're going to read that real shortly. I call that the rapture verse. Revelation 6.2, I call that the Antichrist appearing verse. And Revelation 6.17, I call that the tribulation begins verse. There is a loose end that had never been tied up. By the way, just so you know, scholars will label Revelation lots of things. Very few of them label it wonderful, but I do. If you ask me what the favorite book my favorite book in the Bible, I will tell, always tell you it's Revelation. Why? It makes me go study 800 references in the Old Testament. And it wraps everything up. It finishes every promise God ever made that had not been fulfilled to this point. God, if you know anything about our God, He is a God of His Word. He will not stop until everything that He's promised is done. And it takes this book to finish everything that He promised. Matthew 16, 28 had a very interesting statement. And I used to read this before I studied Revelation, and I did not understand it. It was one of those, file it in the part of your brain where it says, I'll get that someday, but not today. Well, today I want you to understand it. So I'm in Matthew 16, 28. Verily I say unto you, this is Jesus himself talking right before he ascends. There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. When in the world did that happen? Because right after that, he was ascended and they all got martyred except for John. And this, this book of Revelation fulfills that promise that Jesus gave to his disciples because John is going to be snatched up. He's still alive. He was on Patmos, remember. He's snatched up, and he gets to see the whole picture. Remember I told you, it's a panoramic view. He sees snippets and bits, and he gets to see the end when the king of kings comes on his big white war horse to claim the whole earth, coming in his kingdom. So this finally gets fulfilled here because Jesus told his beloved. There, some of you will not taste death till you see it. This is John. John is going to get to see Jesus coming in his kingdom and his glory. And that's a fulfillment of one of the promises. So John is the answer to that.
I've given you umpteen rapture passages. Now, you know the big five. I call them the fave five. They're at the end of this section of studies. You have them. I don't, I probably have probably given them to you 20 times. You may have your own favorite fives, but I also went through and gave you some others that people use. Those are for your reference. You need to know what you know. I don't have any trouble quoting uh, Thessalonians 4.16 or, or uh, 1 Corinthians 15.51. I know these in my heart. But I gave you some other ones that are just pretty neat too. Then I gave you second coming passages, which some people will try to get confused. The thief in the night one is not you. I'm going to say that right off the bat, and we'll get more into that. Oh, you, he's going to snatch you like a thief in the night. That's not you. You're no, he's never going to snatch you like a thief in the night. That's a whole different story. You are the one with the twinkling of eye, the shout of the archangel trumpet and the dead in Christ will rise first and you will be caught up the harpazo with him in the clouds that's you that's no thief in the night that's your king calling you home and I have a feeling Michael the archangel I can't prove this but it would be just like God when it says the archangel shouts I think he shouts your name and I think you hear it and how could he do that for millions and trillions and gazillions of people because he's God I think when that shout comes, you hear your name in in the twinkling of an eye, but which, by the way, is 20 times faster than a blink. It has something to do with the speed of light, and I'm not going to go into that now because that gets really technical, but it's, it's 20 times faster than a blink. And I believe when that rapture happens, Michael shouts your name, the Lord's standing there, his voice booms out like a trumpet, and you are caught up, harpot sewed, to be with him forever and ever. Okay? But those rapture passages are for you. We're going to outline a little bit of this chapter 4 and 5. And I, and I included 5 in this wishful thinking. Not going to happen tonight. But it, we will. We will do it. So you may want to read on a, as we get ready to do that. But the very first thing we're going to spend some time on is uh, chapter 4, verse 1. And that's the harpazo. That's the rapture. And I'm going to read that to you right now so you get what I'm saying. Because this, to me, is proof positive point three in my proving to you the rapture happens and this I'm reading to you from Revelation 4 verse 1 after this remember harpazo that's, if you were reading that in Greek that would say harpazo after this after what after the churches we just studied the churches so after the church age you could infiltrate that right in there after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as if it were a trumpet talking with me. God's voice sounds like a trumpet. It sounded like that on Sinai. It sounds like that here. It sounds like it when Ezekiel heard it. It sounded like it when Isaiah heard it. Anyone that's had a privy to hearing a voice of God in the heavenlies, it sounds like a trumpet. Don't know. Sounds wonderful to me. The first voice which I heard was as if it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be metatauta. So right here, John's raptured up. And he's, and God, the voice of the trumpet. Now we could split hairs. Could it be Jesus? Absolutely. Could it be Almighty God? Absolutely. Are they different? Yes. Are they the same? Yes. How does that look? I don't know. I believe in the Trinity. I can't explain it, but I just believe it. And either one of them could have been, or they could have both been saying it. But doesn't matter that God calls him up, he raptures his up, and it's not a dream. This is a real bodily experience where he is raptured up. This is the picture for you of the New Testament church being called up. This is point three on why I believe we're raptured. He's raptured right here. Who is he? He is going to be representing you. He is John is the New Testament church, the New Testament believer, born again believer in Christ, He's still alive, and he's taken up. This is you. This is a picture of the rapture 
Revelation 4 1 is the rapture picture. And he's harpazoed. Remember the Greek word for snatched up. He it, it, nowhere does it say. I was dreaming on the banks of the Shinar, which I'm I'm not making fun of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. They're great prophets. But that's not the experience here. This is John being harpazoed up into the heavenlies. Now, another thing I want to tell you is that there were others who have seen the throne room. We're getting ready to see the throne room. This is not unique to just John. I'm going to remind you of Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain. Twain means two, of course. With twain he covered his feet. With twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy. Always the seraphim cherubim say that three times because of the Trinity. They always say holy, holy worshiping all three. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said, I, woe is me. Now remember, this is Isaiah. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, send me. Ezekiel has a very like experience. I want you to know they're seeing cherubim, around the throne of God. There, Isaiah saw the throne. He said, I saw the throne high and lifted up, and the whole train of the Lord filled the temple. He's sitting in the temple up there. Did you know that? He's sitting on a throne. Pay attention to what Ezekiel says. Ezekiel 1, verse 5. Also out of the midst, therefore, came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a cast foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. I think we saw Jesus' feet looking like that earlier, didn't we? Hmm. Just saying. Some similarities. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And their four and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went one, every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion. On the right side they had the face of an ox. On the left side they they four also had the face of an eagle. Thus their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. This is Ezekiel's description of the throne room. And then we have John's. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as a voice of a trumpet talking with me said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And then I'm going to take you to a final part of Revelation you can look forward to, 21.10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. John is going to see the beginning and the end. Ezekiel and Isaiah saw the beginning. They saw the throne room of God. They saw the four living creatures. I want to say right now, I am in contrast with what the New King James calls these. They call them beasts. They're not. If you do a study on the Greek word, they are living spiritual beings. Those of you who studied Michael Heiser, these are unseen realm creatures. And they around the throne that Ezekiel sees, that Isaiah sees, that John sees, are either cherubim or seraphim. Scholars differ, and I'm not going to nitpick about it. They may both be the same. They both, may both be a little different. doesn't matter. They're creatures that live 
and work and function around the throne of God 24-7 saying, holy, 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 worshiping all three of the Trinity. And they are similar. Their faces are going to have, and we're going to discuss why their faces are four different dimensions and different kinds. I have a really good theory about that. We'll see if it holds up with what you think. Uh, you need to know that what John is seeing, this makes a difference for the book of Revelation. It is not an image. It is not a vision. He, he will tell you, I looked 70 times in this 22 chapter book. It's not, I was dreaming and as I was sleeping in my mind's eye. No, no, no. He's there. He's been raptured up into the heavenly realm to see beginning to end of this period we call the tribulation. <coughs> the time of Jacob's trouble. The seven years God set apart to bring his nation Israel back to him before the end of all things happens. That's what the tribulation is. Not about you, church. Get yourself out of the way of it. It's not about you. You get raptured out by the king and you're in a marriage supper of the lamb for seven years. And I'm going to prove that to you, too. We're going to do the Jewish wedding. Uh, he also says, I saw 35 different times. I saw this. I'm not I was dreaming and I visioned it. No. I saw. Pretty easy English. He says, I beheld seven times. He says, I heard. The sounds, I think, if I present this story to you right, you're going to hear the story. You're going to see it. And you're going to smell it. Because there's going to be fire that comes up and a smoke and a sultry smell that comes up out of the pit. And you're, going to, and you're going to feel and hear these creatures with their wings and their flappings and their holy, holy, holy over and over around the fiery throne room of God. And you should begin to smell the smoke and hear the sounds and begin to see the sights because that's how John writes this. He writes this for us. There's the only book in the Bible that we get the blessing to do this. So God meant us to read it. The rest of the story is it was addressed to the seven local churches and said to be sent out. It's not to be hidden or kept back. In the end of Daniel, who I lay a Daniel, I'll lay Daniel across this a lot of times, but Daniel's 500 years before this. And at the end of Daniel, Daniel's so disturbed by he sees the same story. And, and God says to him, seal it up. Seal the book up. It's not for now. And Daniel does. Because it's very troublesome to Daniel to see what's happening. But not to John. He said, write it. Send it. See it. Smell it. Hear it. And then write that down and get it out to the churches. And by the way, that should be thumb pointing out yourself. You are the church. This book is for you. So these words are not just for John. They're for you. So the oldest rapture verse in the Bible I want to take you to. This is where I'm going to take you and prove to you that uh, the rapture is all over the Bible. This is not when people argue with you, and they will. I have a couple in my family that would like to. But this pretty much shuts them down. They like to say that, oh, the rapture's not really true because in 1800 a guy named Darby thought it up and blah, blah, blah. Hogwash. I'll take him right to, and let's go to this book right now. Job, oldest book in the Bible, 19, verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. That's the rapture. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Remember that? Job knows I'm going to be dead. My body's going to be in the grave and the worms are going to eat them. But he says, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself. Not in other words, just a thought of it. I'm going to be raised up. My old dead body is going to be restored, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my... Reigns be consumed within me. That's the first rapture book ever in the Bible. Oldest book in the Bible. Just saying. And then you've got the one of the faith five, First Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That's what Job was saying. My body's going to be asleep in the ground. The worms are already going to eat me. But I know I'm going to see my Redeemer. And here's what Paul answers that. 
that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, that means dead in the grave, will God bring with him. For this we sing unto you by the word of the Lord, that which we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall be sent from heaven with a shout. There's that shout. With the voice of the archangel, I think Michael's calling your name. With this trump of God. God's voice sounds like a trumpet. Get used to it. We're going to live with him forever. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The Lord does not step on earth during the rapture. This is the verse that tells you that. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. And I want to say to people that tell me, the church is going through the tribulation. I said, Jesus says comfort each other with the words of the rapture. How are you comforted thinking you're going to get this, the, the snot beat out of you and you get yourself beheaded and, and trampled? What comfort is that? Oh, well, God's able to take us through that. No, he's able to take you out of it. It's harpazo. It means snatched away. And it even makes more sense when you realize he's not coming to earth to get you. He's in a cloud and he's snatching you up there. I love it. I think the picture of this, when you get who you are and who you are in him compared to the Israelites who did not accept God and he has to thump their noggins. For seven years to get them, some of them to come to him. That's not you. You heard the story of the cross. You heard about the redemption and the blood flowing. And you accepted that. Why would he beat you up over that? It's not you. I And, and the quote is, we're for comfort one another with these words. I take great comfort in the rapture. That is my comfort. I get up every morning looking and saying, is it, is it today? Is it today? I'm ready. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Trump of God, uh, we've talked about that, the voice of a trumpet. He just, he just has that. I like, I'm going to give you another one of my faith five rapture verses. And, then, and you're going to get them off and on through this. But John 14, love John, love John. Now remember, this is one of his more scholarly writings because... His revelation writings are more hodgepodge, short, quippy, quickly written, not exercised exponentially. But John, St. John's really pretty. So John 14 is one of my favorite uh, of the rapture verses. And I am in John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Notice that receive you unto myself. Not I will come down on earth and get you. That receive is that harpazo and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. I want to tell you that that hand of the rapture means this. You pick every word apart. He's going to receive you up to himself. He also goes to prepare a place for you. And I've said this to people, and they've not thought this past. And I hadn't thought it past until I studied Revelation. When you die, the Christian saint is told, well, you're going to go to heaven, which you are. You don't have your permanent body until the rapture. And then you're going to live in heaven forever. That's not really true. Here's how it looks. If you die before the rapture, you immediately, Jesus said to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. So your spirit's there. However that looks, I don't know. At the rapture, your old dead body is raised up, got, and you're united with your spirit. You've got your brand new immortal bodies. And those of us that are still alive, get our die on our feet, get our brand new. And you know how that looks. And then you go for seven years to what we used to call heaven because that's above the fray of the tribulation. It's up above. He has mansions prepared for you because you're going to be busy for seven years. You're going to be in training for what's going to happen in the millennial period. And that's what we lovingly call heaven. But you don't stay there forever. 
Because in Revelation 19, when Jesus comes back on his big white war horse to battle, we're on our horses behind him, cheering him. But as soon as the battle's over, we enter the earth with him and follow him into the millennial kingdom, which is on earth, not in heaven. And we rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So this verse about, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. Um, I used to think that's for your forever home. No, that's just your that's just your where you're staying during the tribulation. Because your many mansions are not in heaven. They're going to be in the millennial period with the king of kings. And then after that, then you're going to be in a new heaven and new earth. So we've been told we live up, quote, quote, in heaven after, not after the tribulation, you don't. We come down on earth as immortals, and we get put to work. I love that. So if that doesn't make sense to you, then I didn't explain that very well. But John 14 is a rapture verse. I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. That there ye may be with me also. And it's part of the Jewish wedding. He went to his Father's house to prepare his bride a place. And we will, we will pick that apart here in a minute. I love that John 14 verse. I never understood it till I understood what the Millennial Kingdom was. Now, I'm going to throw this out to you. You do not have to agree with me, but then I would say, why wouldn't you? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I have three Old Testament references I think will, besides the Job one, which I first presented, I have three others that I think point to the rapture. And I'm going to read them all to you. I know this is tedious, and maybe this is a review but I don't want you to miss any of this, guys. And if we just don't get very far on tonight's lesson, we'll just take up where we left off. Because this is too important not to know. Because people will say to you, the rapture is not in the Old Testament. And then you say, oh, contraire. Why don't you take them to Isaiah 26, the 19th verse. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body they shall rise. Does this sound to you like the rapture? Awake and sing ye that dwell in the dust. These are dead people. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Didn't Paul say, and the dead in Christ shall rise first? Yep. And shall meet with him there. I'm just saying, come my people. This is God. Now these are these are believers. This is what God says to them. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers. John 14 says, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions. Isaiah says, come, my people, enter into thy chambers. House, go to prepare a place for you. And shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until what? The indignation be overpassed. Isaiah saying, your dead body's going to rise and you're going to go to chambers prepared for by God for you until all the tribulation is past. That's what he's hinting at here. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. What is the purpose of the tribulation? God is sending his son to finally make judgment on the whole world. You're with him. It's not about you. Isaiah seeing the rapture. And the tribulation. And I think if you can't make that out of those words, then I think you need to reread it. Now remember, he's 800 years before Jesus. He doesn't even know Jesus' name. But he's doing his best in his limited scope of what he knows to prophesy what he's seeing. He's prophesying the rapture and the tribulation and that you're going to be hidden in those special chambers that John called... Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house. And Isaiah says, you're going to be hidden in those chambers for a little while. And it is just a little while. It's just seven years. Now, Zephaniah 2.3 is another kicker. Listen to this one. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. Here's what I love. It may be 
ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Yes, you will. He's going to hide you. He's going to rapture you up, give you your new body, and hide you in his father's house. And here's a, a, an Old Testament prophet, a minor prophet, right, written 600 years before Jesus, saying it may, it may just be that he hides you from this. Absolutely. Now we're going to even go further back. Let's go to King David about a thousand years before Jesus in Psalm 27, 5. For in the time of trouble, what is the tribulation called over and over in the Bible? The time of Jacob's trouble. Because the tribulation is about getting Jacob, getting Israel back. And, and David said, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. That's his house. You starting to get the hint? Being hid in the Father's house. Being escaping out of the trouble. Getting out of God's wrath and being in his mansions. And King David says, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. God is sitting in, in the throne room in heaven. And he is going to send his son to get you to hide you up there. He shall set me upon who? A rock. David didn't know his name was Jesus. Didn't know he was coming from his loins. But he knows that God's going to hide you in his pavilion, in his house place, in his tabernacle. And he's going to hide you in the rock. Do you see it? Am I making it clear enough? Because to me it's crystal clear. That it is all over the Bible, starting with the oldest book of all, Job. Filtering through a thousand years before Jesus to King David. And then about 700 years we've got Zephaniah. And about 600 years we have Isaiah speaking of it. And then when we get into the New Testament, it is everywhere. And even these Old Testament gurus didn't know Jesus' name, but they knew what they saw. They knew there was a wrath on the earth coming that God was going to hide his own from. And John, in the very first verse of chapter 4, says, Come up here. God says to him, Come up here. John's you. When he says to you and shouts your name in that twinkling of eyes, it's got to be really fast and your ears have to be able to work. Linda, come up here. That's what it's going to sound like. And in that twinkling of an eye, you're going to be snatched away, hidden in that secret chambers, which all of these authors have written. Now, there are other raptures in the Bible. This is not the only one. Let me give you some hints. Enoch was raptured. And I'm, just, I'm not going to read all these. You can look them up for yourself. They're really, really interesting. Of course, you should know this. And I don't know that I reviewed this right off, but you should know it. Revelation is filled with the sevens. It, um, there are so many groups of sevens because it's the perfect number, finished number for God. But it is very, very intriguing to me that there are seven different raptures in the Bible, okay? Enoch's raptured. Elijah's raptured. Of course, Jesus is raptured up. I mean, you can call it what you want to. When he's snatched up, he's raptured up. Uh, Philip is raptured. Paul has an interesting... We're not going to go too much into this today, but this would be a real great side trip. If we ever actually study 2 Corinthians, we'll go into this. But I'm going to read to you 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Now, everybody thinks this Paul is talking about himself. He doesn't want to brag. Paul is very, very humble, very much like uh, John is. And so he's telling a story to these people about heaven and all he goes well now I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago whether in this body I cannot tell or whether out of this body I cannot tell God knoweth such and one caught up to the third heaven and I knew such a man whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter and he never wrote any more about it because he said, I can't tell you anymore. But Paul was raptured up into heaven, saw a vision very much like Ezekiel saw, like Isaiah saw, and very much like John was raptured up. John's raptured in seeing this. Paul said, well, I, I knew a man that did that. It's him. 
So that's another kind of rapture. We are, we're not going to go into that tonight. That's not our study, but just to, just to point out that it was a kind of a rapture. Then, of course, the rapture of the body of Christ, which we've uh, listed as one of our faith five of the rapture verses in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. And then John's raptured up right here. This is the seventh rapture tonight when he said, and I uh, looked up and behold, the door was open in heaven. The first voice which I heard was as if it were a trumpet talking with me and said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. He's raptured right then. That's the rapture verse for Revelation 4. I don't know much about the resurrection body except twice in the Bible it has a very peculiar term. It's called the house. Oketarian, I think, is the Greek word for it. In 2 Corinthians 5, we get a hint of something um, almost weird. I want to read it to you. Because this is about the rapture. This is about our body changing. For we know that if our earthly house, and that house is, a, is that strange word. It's only used one other place. Of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands. He's referring to our physical body somehow here. Eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Now we know it's not a house. It's the indwelling capsule that we're in. Here's a strange thing about that. Jude, the brother of um, Jesus, when we studied that little book, how many weeks were we on one chapter? Six or seven? It is the most unique, deep little book. If you've not ever studied it, it is so cool. But in Jude 6, and we don't even have to give the chapters, because there is one chapter. It really should say Jude 1, 6. But because there's no other, you just say Jude 6. And the angels which kept not, not their first estate. This is a reference back to the Genesis 6 fallen angels which had sex with human women. Okay, that's who he's referring to. So he's saying this. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation. That's that word house. They left their bodies. They left their in dwelling capsule, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness into the judgment of the great day. Those fallen angels traded their heavenly bodies for a human body so they could impregnate earthly women to clout the gene pool of all the earth so no Messiah could came. They made that point. And this is the reference when we are translated up and raptured, we are house changes. That's the only two places in the Bible you're going to see those two references. It refers to your earthly capsule somehow becomes a spiritual one, but yet we do know when Jesus rose from the dead, he still looked like a person. He still ate. He still walked. He went all over. He could talk. They could feel him. It's a different house. And the heavenly angels, those fallen angels that came to earth in Genesis 6, gave up their house. And we're going to get those eternal houses. That's why I think you should know that. Now, I want to talk to you about the Jewish wedding. And this may be as far as we get tonight. We may not even finish four because I know it's late and you guys are tired. But you have to understand the Jewish wedding to understand Revelation. The Jewish wedding is a picture throughout Revelation of what is actually going to happen. So that when God begins to explain to John, a Jew, what's happening about the bridegroom and the bride and the two witnesses and the father's house and I go to prepare a place for you. John doesn't give you much detail about that because he totally got it. This was typical for every Jew. This, this was classic. Every Jewish wedding went through this process. So we as Gentiles don't understand the model of the Jewish wedding. And this model of the Jewish wedding is exactly how Revelation is going to be set up. So this is how it starts. First of all, there is a betrothal, the keturah. Isaiah 49, 18, Lift up thine eyes round about, and behold, all these gather themselves together and come to thee as I live, saith the Lord. Thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all as with an ornament, and bind them on thee as a bride doth, doeth. The betrothal. 
the Keturah happened as a big deal. That's what Mary and Joseph had gone through. They were betrothed. We call it engaged. And, and we don't take that as seriously. It, this was a year-long process where you were promised to someone. You were the same as legally married, except you did not live together yet. And so this betrothal was a huge thing. It was a covenant. The two families came together. And they signed a paper, a covenant. If you were betrothed, it was legally binding. You were bound to that person. And so to be unbound for that would be almost like a divorce. So this is written. This is a betrothal. And that happens, the very first thing is the betrothal, all right? Where the bride is chosen by the groom. The groom chooses his bride. I'm going to lay up on top of this. Jesus chose you. He did. Chose you from before time was. But you as the bride had to accept him. And if you did, then you are his beloved. You are betrothed to him. Right now, we're called the bride of Christ. It would be more accurately for us to say we're the betrothed of Christ. Because not, we're not with him in his house yet. Although they're called brides at that point, they're not with them in the house. That's where we're at. We're in the betrothal stage of the Jewish wedding. Jesus has chosen you, and you have accepted. And we're waiting now for the finish marriage. Okay? That's the first part. After the betrothal papers are signed, and by the way, yours were too, when you accepted Jesus into your heart, he wrote it down in a book. It was a document signed. You are betrothed to him. That's signed in blood. And it's written down. So after the documents of the betrothal are signed, the bridegroom goes to his father's house to prepare a place for his bride. Where's Jesus? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you, my bride, my betrothed, my covenant wife. I'm not with you, you're not with me now. I went, I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for you. That's the second part of the Jewish wedding. So as the bridegroom departs for his father's house, in the old Jewish tradition, they lived with the father. They built on a little addition. If they were richer, they built on a pretty big addition. Sometimes they just built on a room. But the bridegroom has <coughs> permission from the father to prepare the house for the bride to join them. You're starting to get a picture of how this is going to play out for us. Jesus is in his father's house preparing a place for us with permission from the father. Okay? Then there's this, then there's a, um, a custom that the the bride is to be prepared. She is t she she knows it's going to take about a year. She, it may take a little less. But it depends on how long it takes them to build this addition. The minute that betrothal was signed and the bridegroom away, she began preparing. She began getting her furniture that she was going to move with her, her uh, clothes that she was going to wear, her wedding dress for the, the wedding. Um, uh, she was, some of them took maids with them. They began getting all their trunks together because what happened in the Jewish wedding is the bridegroom did not warn the bride when he was coming. He often came at midnight as a surprise to get his bride. And he did not often know until his father said, go get your bride. And then he scurried with two witnesses, at least two witnesses, and he went and got his bride who he had to wake up. Wake up out of sleep. I, the bridegroom's here, and she better be prepared because there was no more time for preparation. So that's the next part. So that surprise. Let me read to you what Jeremiah 7, 34 says. Then will I cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom. That's when he goes to get the bride. And the voice of the bride for the land shall be desolate. In other words, it was great excitement when the bridegroom came for the bride. There was screaming and yelling, and the girls were getting up, get your stuff together. The bride, is, the bridegroom's here, and the bride, the the bride and the, and, her, and her friends were getting all of her stuff together because he had come back for her. And that was the next part of the Jewish wedding. And that then it's called the hoopah. 
the wedding. They still call it the hoopah today. And of course, that's where the uh, actual wedding happens. And, and following that, after he's taken her away to his father's house and they've had the hoopah, then there's a seven-day marriage supper, which they celebrate for seven days at the father's house. And there's lots and lots of verses about that. The What you should understand about that whole picture of the Jewish wedding is that's exactly what Jesus is acting out. Where are we at in that? He's gone back to his father's house to prepare a place for us, according to John 14. It will be a surprise. Paul said, watch always for his return. Watch always. That's what they told the bride. Watch always. He can come anytime. Be ready. Did we not just spend seven weeks setting the seven churches? And I told you that most of them are not ready for him to come back. Two of them are promised they're going through the trip. They're not ready. But for those that are ready, he promises he will come for them. In fact, when he says to the church of Philadelphia that, that you will go, you will be raptured. If you are ready, if you're the bride that is ready, your bridegroom is coming. Now, there was a purchase price established in this Jewish wedding of which had to be paid. And there was a covenant written and established. There was an agreement which had to be signed. The bride was to be set apart totally for him and, and was kept herself to him, just for him until he came. Um, when the bridegroom left his father's house, it was at the father's bidding. The bridegroom did not know the exact date till the father said, go get your bride. There were two witnesses that accompanied him to go get his bride. If you know anything about, we haven't said it yet, there are going to be two witnesses come down in the tribulation. And then this fulfilled covenant, she joined the groom at his father's house. I just think if you understand that picture of the Jewish wedding, it makes a whole law, lot more sense. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. I think we can say that's the bride joining the bridegroom. Comes as a surprise. He comes to take his bride to the Father's house. And, and so now I'm going to read to you, we're going to go over just a couple of verses, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to close it tonight a little bit early because I know it's a lot to do. And we'll take up right where we left off. But I want to read to you Revelation 4.1. After this I looked, and behold, the door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as if it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Verse 2, and immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. And I'm going to stop us there until next time. And if you're if you're following page-wise, I'm on 138. The way I want to end tonight is this. I want you to know this about this part of Revelation. We are raptured. If you're a believer in Christ and you are dedicated to him, you will be raptured. I'm going to prove it to you as many ways as I can, and then you have to search for yourself. If you have questions about that, please ask. Please search. Please bring other verses. But I want to say this to you. You serve a king who is your groom. He has gone away to his father's house to prepare a place for you. He wants to come back to a bride that's ready and waiting and keeping herself totally to him. Because when he does, it'll be in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, with a shout and the voice and the trumpet. And we will be with him forever. Father, I thank you for the revelation. I thank you for the truth of the rapture. And Lord, let me be careful to make your words so clear that nobody have any questions about that. I love you. I worship you, and I ask if anyone hears this and doesn't know you as Savior, they would either get in touch with me or fall on their face and just ask you tonight to come into their hearts. We love you, and we give you great praise and honor in Jesus' name.